Good evening and Happy New Year. My name is Liz McCart and I am a volunteer at the Chatham Marconi Maritime Center. Welcome to the first speaker series of the year. We're so excited to continue these talks into 2021. As a reminder, you can ask questions during the presentation by typing in your question in the icon at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will get to as many questions as we can. We start the new year by going to the depths of the ocean and exploring how technology enables humans to better understand and explore the ocean in increasing detail. It is my privilege tonight to introduce our speaker, Andy Bowen. Andy is the ocean engineer and director of the National Deep Submergence Faculty Facility, excuse me, of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He has worked at Hui for more than 30 years, helping to push the boundaries of what underwater robotic vehicles can do. He has participated in dozens of oceanographic cruises to explore the ocean, often learning the hard way that the ocean is an unforgiving place. As a director of the National Deep Submergence Facility at Hui, he is currently helping to create a new suite of technology for the Ocean Twilight Project, known as Oz. Oz, I think that's right, Andy. Um, he revolutionary um, the, our understanding of a little known part of the ocean. Other professional interests include remotely operated submersibles, propulsion systems, application of closed loop control of remotely operated vehicles, and introduction of remotely operated systems for oceanographic research. So Andy, thanks so much for joining us tonight, and I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, really, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some uh, insights and uh, giving a cook's tour, if you will, uh, with regard to the world of uh, what I would call uh, deep submergence. Um, thanks uh, also uh, to you for putting together the presentation and to Ron Ferris for his uh, expert technical uh, assistance in getting this off the ground. It's, uh, as I say, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, try to, uh, you know, at uh, maybe breakneck speed, uh, sort of describe uh, the last hundred years of, uh, of technology as it relates to exploring the ocean. Um, give you some examples of how that technology uh, can be used. Uh, and uh, and then maybe a little bit of a look or view forward as well. Um, as Liz said, I'm a, a principal engineer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, and for those of you that are Cape Cod residents, you may know Woods Hole as a leading organization uh, uh, exploring uh, the ocean and uh, learning about the natural ocean environment, uh, uh, which of course involves a range of uh, technologies. And uh, that's certainly my part of, uh, of, uh, of a role in the Woods Hole team. So, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, I'll start off just by sort of reflecting, I suppose, on some of the early technologies uh, for exploring the ocean. And in the 19, uh, late 1920s, early uh, 30s, uh, William uh, Beebe and Otis Barton actually were uh, the first people to actually explore beyond the surface waters, things, uh, for example, that, uh, that we all are familiar with in a coastal environment, and they used a, a uh, bathyscaphe as pitch, pictured on the upper left-hand side. Um, the progression of technology was relatively modest, let's say, uh, um, but continued to dive deeper and deeper. And the graphic here sort of shows, I suppose, you know, a, a, a representation of the ocean down to its deepest points. Um, the, the, the key insight 
perhaps, is that uh, exploring the ocean with a flashlight, um, you can imagine, is a, is a time-consuming and laborious activity. Um, certainly, it was uh, the type of uh, adventure that uh, that ocean oceanographers uh, engaged in in the early days, but as the graphic sort of represents, uh, again, you're looking at a complex environment just with the headlights of your car, and you can imagine, of course, how long, for instance, it might take to grasp the full sort of spatial context of something like the Grand Canyon if we didn't have satellite photos. And the ocean is opaque to us. Uh, and this is sort of the, the vision that you get in the uh, deep ocean. Things really uh, changed uh, and accelerated starting, uh, uh, I think, in the, in the 1960s. And as uh, many cases, uh, you know, uh, technology is driven by a need for uh, security. Uh, and, uh, you know, the loss of the uh, United States uh, submarine thresher tragically in 1963 uh, and, the, and the desire to understand uh, its loss um, and be able to uh, learn from that disaster was really something that I think uh, led to the development uh, in a much more purposeful way uh, for technology sort of writ large in terms of how uh, to explore the ocean. Um, and, and, and the legacy from those times is really what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, is where it brings us today. Um, back uh, and, uh, when I sort of entered the, the uh, discipline, I suppose, this was uh, an, an example of the state-of-the-art robotic system. Um, and in the background, you can see this little uh, spherical-shaped robot, uh, which was equipped with propulsion and a television camera. And the individual uh, seated in the foreground actually has a head-mounted display, uh, fairly clumsy in its, uh, in its in, as, as we would see it today. But in those days, this was sort of the, the way of projecting a human presence into the ocean. So the operator saw what the robot saw and was in a position to be able to control it and kind of create uh, his own reality underwater through the use of this type of innovative uh, and, and really at the time leading edge technology. Um, in, uh, in Woods Hole during this time, uh, there was a great deal of activity and uh, uh, Dr. Robert Ballard, uh, who is a geologist at the, at the institution, was a, a leader and still remains uh, an important presence to this day in terms of exploring the ocean. And he proposed the development of a technology that would give much more of a uh, larger view of the ocean. So instead of those headlights that I showed early on, uh, the idea is, could you learn more through the use of deploying uh, complex technology? Um, uh, certainly, uh, complex sonar systems uh, mounted to the hull of ships is capable of seeing the seafloor. Uh, but because of physics and the nature of sound, it has certain limitations in terms of the resolution. So uh, the image on the left uh, sort of shows uh, kind of little footprints and, you know, that could in the deepest parts of the ocean give you kind of an average depth for something the size of a football field, which isn't very good if you're interested in finding submarines or uh, learning about the fabric uh, of the seafloor and uh, documenting all the wonderful uh, natural phenomena. And to, and to provide that next level of, of resolution, you really need to to get closer, and this was the basic idea. So this image, which appeared in National Geographic, I think in 1980 or 81, sort of shows the uh, long cable suspended from the ship, and at the end of that cable is a robot which combines a range of, uh, of capabilities, including uh, sonar, higher resolution sonar, which uh, is appropriate for use over much smaller distances, but has a, a significantly higher resolution, as well as imaging systems. And a little robot that is sort of emerging out the back of all of this. 
this is about the time that I uh, joined uh, the institution. Having spent uh, a little bit of time in industry, it was really an opportunity to come and uh, do something that was uh, quite unusual and, and, uh, and join Ballard's team. Um, you know, as we as we began uh, the development of that uh, capability, uh, you can see the submersible Alvin, which is sort of the crown jewel, if you will, in Woods Hole's uh, uh, arsenal of tools for exploring the ocean. This image shows Alvin uh, with a small robot actually mounted to the front of the uh, of the of the vehicle, um, and. Uh, this was really our first step in the development of deep ocean uh, tethered robotic systems. And while long tethers didn't really exist, uh, uh, there was adaptations of mining technologies and uh, the, the, the very earliest uh, interest in fiber optics. So instead of uh, 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 fighting that particular battle of how one deals with and develops cables, uh, we sort of uh, divided and conquered and that, uh, that the cable technology was developed in parallel with the use of these robots. And so to remove the cable, we were able to actually take the human operators and the vehicle itself down and the submersible uh, operated at relatively modest distances from the submarine and provide uh, an opportunity to sort of cut our teeth as it were on the development of these sorts of tools. Um, you know, uh, most notably, I suppose, uh, uh, the deployment of the Jason Jr. robot from the front of Alvin uh, during the 1986 expedition to Titanic. It was discovered in 1985 by, by Bob Ballard and uh, the Woods Hole team. Um, was an opportunity to deploy the technology in a very novel way. Uh, and while you can see from this graphic, uh, it might have been a dangerous and unwise thing to take a submarine inside Titanic with the potential for being trapped. Uh, in this case, we were able to use the, uh, the uh, sort of robot to, uh, to deploy um, our virtual presence inside the ship and inspect uh, uh, the uh, the wreck itself. Um, you know, I should note, and there are records that are now available that this type of technology was used once again for defense-related purposes and to explore submer submarines uh, that were on the seafloor uh, to learn more about the specifics of their loss and or the nature of uh, how they operated in the case of adversaries. Um, if, if, at Woods Hole, again, uh, this is a, a picture of our group uh, that's a, a young Andy Bowen in the top center there. Uh, uh, this is sort of an outgrowth of that small Jason Jr. vehicle. This is sort of the next step where we married uh, what we learned from Jason Jr. to the uh, tether cables that uh, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And it was really, uh, I think, one of the first practical deep diving uh, robots that uh, was was uh, was in operation worldwide, um, and uh, and we pioneered the the uh, the development and application of of that technology, and this uh, is part of the part of the team that uh, that helped to make that possible. Um, the 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 technology uh, it, you know matured over time, and uh, uh, if you recall the graphic I showed from the early 1980s, this would be uh, 10 years or plus on. Uh, we have uh, instead of the cartoon, this is sort of the embodiment of the of the resulting capability, uh, and it really is sort of three systems. Um, and starting on the left. Uh, we have sort of the Argo vehicle, uh, which basically combined a series of sonar systems as well as uh, very sensitive uh, cameras that provided images of the seafloor at ranges of perhaps of 30 feet, 10 meters or so, which would give you a fairly large view of the seafloor. In the middle is a, is a uh, sonar system, and I should have started uh, describing that first because that's the tool that was deployed close to the seafloor. And as opposed to Argo, which is suspended 10 meters above, 
the ocean uh, uh, floor, uh, the sonar system was towed at speeds ranging of about a knot uh, at, our, at heights of 300 feet um, and gave us uh, a, um, a swath of, uh, of sonar imagery of the seafloor out to about 3,000 feet. Um, so that's the sort of large area map, the sonar. Then uh, one's able to deploy the Argo system to get the next level of resolution, including imagery. And once you'd found areas of specific interest, of course, you could deploy the JSON ROV, and that had a series of television cameras and lights, as uh, you might sort of see here in the in the photograph on the right. Uh, and uh, included a very er early version of a mechanical arm uh, that was used to deploy instruments and take samples. And, and these tools uh, matured uh, to become companions to the Alvin submersible, which, uh, as I mentioned, is, uh, is a, is a uh, system that's been operated uh, now in uh, uh, Woods Hole since uh, the mid-1960s. And so for the first time, we were able to actually team or uh, uh, collaborate, as it were, between the human operators and the submersible and the use of the robots, which have, of course, uh, not the same characteristics, but unique characteristics in so far as being able to provide a much larger view of the ocean um, and do so for a, a long period of time, uh, as opposed to the submersible, which makes uh, dives to the deep ocean. And because of the, uh, uh, the humans uh, within uh, is limited in terms of its endurance. Um, and it's really the teaming of these things that still remains to this day uh, an incredibly valuable and important part of the uh, tools that are available to oceanographers to, to look at the, look at the uh, uh, ocean and learn about uh, all the uh, various phenomena. Um, so, so this is sort of the, the tools that uh, really are very much uh, uh, active uh, uh, today and sort of uh, the, uh, the resulting outcome of the efforts that we undertook. Um, so as I mentioned, the Alvin submersible, uh, but now paired with uh, the uh, what's grown to be a much larger vehicle. So if you remember that small robot uh, uh, on the front of Alvin, uh, you can see what we have today, which is something about the size of a minivan, and that's the Jason ROV. So it's gone from being quite small and modest to a, a new version, uh, which is pictured uh, in the upper left. Um, and then uh, instead of the towed sonar systems, what have emerged, and I'll talk in more detail about this, uh, is, an, is sort of a, another class of vehicles. Um, as opposed to the remotely operated vehicles, these are called autonomous underwater vehicles or uh, otherwise known as AUVs. So we have uh, human-occupied submersibles, HOVs. We have uh, remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, and then finally the uh, yellow object in the center here is an autonomous underwater vehicle um, that's operated by the oceanographic called Sentry. Um, and it is uh, one of a family of systems that is available for researchers. Uh, these vehicles are operated by a lo uh, large group of people. You can see again in the photograph, uh, each one of them may operate up to uh, 150 to as many as perhaps 200 days a year out in the field uh, worldwide. And uh, they're available in the same way that a super collider or a radio telescope or any large research facility to researchers in the United States. And in fact, um, uh, through international collaborations often to uh, researchers in other countries um, who uh, propose uh, use of these vehicles uh, to do their science and then are awarded uh, that time through a, through a facilities arrangement. And the uh, National Science Foundation is the lead agency that supports the deep submergence facility, but we also receive uh, funding and support and, uh, and, and use from uh, NOAA and the Office of Naval Researchers, all of whom have researchers that oftentimes use these tools for, for, for their uh, work. Um, 
moving sort of beyond uh, those tools and into an area that, uh, uh, you know, is uh, always about exploration. Um, the uh, objective of reaching and exploring the deepest part of the ocean has uh, been something that is uh, sort of the Mount Everest, if you will, of, uh, of the deep ocean. Um, it was uh, first visited uh, in uh, uh, 19... Um, Oh, 19, I think 1961, uh, perhaps, uh, by the Trieste Submersible, um, uh, uh, Captain um, Don Walsh and uh, Jacques Picard uh, visited the deepest part of the ocean in the Western Pacific called Challenger Deep. Uh, and uh, that is uh, over seven miles deep. And they used it, uh, they visited that using a technology called a bathyscaphe. It's very similar to a balloon. Uh, Picard's family uh, started in the, in the area of uh, high altitude ballooning and uh, uh, being adventurers turned their interests into the deep ocean. And this device uh, called Trieste is very similar to a balloon, but instead of uh, an envelope filled with gas, uh, lighter than air, uh, helium or hydrogen, this uh, is a, a volume filled with aviation gasoline, um, which, uh, as most of you know, oil floats on water. Gasoline is even lighter. And so this was the buoyant force uh, uh, that provided uh, or offset the weight of the uh, personnel sphere, which is the white object in the bottom where Picard and Walsh actually resided. If we fast forward from uh, 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 those days to um, our great friend James Cameron, uh, who built and dove the Deep Sea Challenger into the deep ocean. Uh, 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 this was in the 19, uh, or excuse me, I think uh, 2010. Uh, 2012. Um, uh, he was uh, successful in, in reaching the deepest part of the ocean. And you can see the progression in technology in terms of uh, size. Uh, and size does uh, matter in terms of making the technology accessible and, and uh, available for, for researchers. Um, and we were given the mandate by the National Science Foundation to build a tool uh, and did so um, using the robotic technology that we've been developing. And this vehicle actually combines both the attributes of an AUV or autonomous underwater vehicle and uh, a tethered vehicle into a single platform. And this was uh, the vehicle that we developed, which is so shown in the center there. No people on board, but it had a very unique tether cable, uh, as well as uh, being able to operate entirely autonomously without that tether cable, and was successful in reaching Challenger Deep in uh, 2009. Um, and uh, we were very proud and excited to have uh, sort of solved the problem, uh, but solved it in, a, in an unusual way, again, through the use of sort of some, some novel uh, thinking. Um, unfortunately, our, uh, our deep sea robot um, uh, met an untimely end uh, some years later after having undertaken a range of, uh, of uh, scientific and engineering expeditions. Um, we'd chosen a fairly risky solution, not only using a very small diameter tether cable, but also the use of ceramics to provide the, uh, the flotation. Um, and uh, many of you uh, can appreciate ceramics as, a, as both a fragile but a wonderfully uh, efficient material under compression. And so ceramics were used both for the flotation and also to contain the electronics uh, needed to make the robot operate. And uh, as it would turn out, unfortunately, the, the risks associated with using such a brittle material was ultimately uh, very high and uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, resulted in the loss of the Nereus vehicle at about 10,000 meters or a little over 30,000 feet of depth in the Western Pacific. And all we got back are these little uh, um, shards or uh, floated, fl components of the vehicle 
uh, that uh, floated back to the surface after its uh, untimely demise. And I carry one of those little pieces with me uh, all the time, just as a reminder uh, for just how unforgiving the ocean is, but also uh, the challenges that we as engineers have in front of us to solve difficult problems, take risks, be willing to uh, have those risks go uh, horribly wrong, as they did in this case, but in doing so, hopefully provide uh, uh, both advances in technologies that help inform future generations, but also, of course, uh, uh, deliver the best possible science. So the 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 I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about sort of the vehicle types. Um, so we've spoken about the submersible, as you see on the bottom, then the tethered vehicles uh, that, uh, that, that are shown in the middle. And then we have this increasingly sort of diverse ecosystem, I'll call of autonomous underwater vehicles. And, and I think there's a story in this and that, uh, you know, a submersible is uh, understandably a very expensive and serious business, uh, putting humans in the deep ocean. Uh, tethered vehicles, uh, perhaps uh, not quite so much the case. And autonomous vehicles um, are the sort of price of entry, if you will, is, is much, much lower. And, and I think that's sort of a, an, an, a, a, uh, a key insight in the sense that, that uh, and these are just uh, autonomous vehicles that are in operation and have been developed at, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, but there's a whole range of additional ones that have, uh, have come into the, into the fore. And uh, I mentioned this sort of idea of, of bringing these two things together, N not so much the this, this submersible, uh, but the robots. Uh, into the sort of hybrid model. And uh, I think as robots have gotten uh, smarter and more intelligent, and more capable, uh, you know, tethered vehicles, which are sort of like a, if you think of them as uh, maybe an aircraft, uh, you know, the early days of uh, aircraft required somebody who was, uh, had their hands on the stick and, uh, and rudder and was flying all, all of the, uh, uh, involved in flying all the aspects of the aircraft. Um, over time, automation has helped to basically take the pilot out of the loop. And I think to a certain extent, that's a part of the story here is that tethered vehicles have become a bit more like autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicles are becoming a little bit more t like tethered vehicles. And, uh, and they've sort of been mashed together into these hybrid vehicles. And uh, perhaps uh, I can, uh, in another uh, opportunity go into more details about how we've used these vehicles, but they're they're important parts of the arsenal that we have available. So I'll talk a little bit about the general characteristics. Some of the underwater vehicles that are in use today are are what we would call gravity powered. So as the graphic suggests, uh, these vehicles come to the surface. They can actually transmit their data via satellite. Uh, they have a very small uh, onboard uh, variable ballast system, so they can make themselves heavy. And as they sink, they actually fly. Uh, on a on a predetermined tra trajectory to a certain depth, at which point they pump out that ballast and return back to the surface. And these types of devices are incredibly efficient, as you would imagine. There's no propellers; they're just using gravity and a modest amount of energy to change their ballast. Um, uh, but they've been successful in in crossing oceans, um, and so the endurance and uh, capability to monitor the ocean, not over very large, not only over very large areas, but for long periods of time is, a, is, a, is an important attribute of these types of glider systems. Um, you know, I mentioned the autonomous vehicles, uh, certainly uh, the types that you're seeing here are uh, now in wider use and uh, are being developed at a breakneck pace. Uh, they go from being uh, rather large, uh, as you can see at the lower image, there's a 
person standing on top of this autonomous system right down to these very small hand-operated systems. And each one of them has special attributes and missions. And, uh, and it's this diversity of, of uh, technology that is providing uh, uh, researchers uh, with a, a increasingly uh, capable uh, ability to, to explore and document the deep ocean. Um, you know, there are a class of, uh, of, of robots that are uh, so-called bio-inspired swimming robots. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the, the anime or the uh, uh, video here of a, of a small robot with a fin. Um, there's also uh, flapping systems, and uh, those are starting to, uh, you know, find a place for themselves. They lack some of the efficiencies of, of, uh, of uh, traditional propeller-based tr uh, propulsion, but uh, I think it's not beyond imagination to think that in the coming years uh, and uh, decades, we'll see uh, systems like this become more and more uh, uh, capable and prevalent and uh, operating more widely in the ocean. Um, the, uh, the, it's a very harsh environment. Uh, certainly, uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, we learned that with our Nereus system. Um, Challenger Deep being uh, nearly 11,000 meters uh, is, uh, as the graphic shows, uh, a good bit deeper than Mount Everest is high. And uh, uh, altitude certainly is a is a challenge to deal with, uh, uh, but it's nothing in comparison to the crushing pressures that exist at 11,000 meters. Uh, it's uh, literally uh, nine or ten tons on every square inch of the vehicle, uh, which uh, of course uh, we have to try to resist through design. Um, and uh, in addition to the crushing pressures and low temperatures, um, we also really don't have a lot of the things that we're used to uh, in everyday life. And certainly terrestrial robotics uh, benefit from tremendously. And that's uh, a lot of the technologies that's been derived or developed for consumer electronics. So the cell phone is shown here. All of the things uh, that we've taken for granted, uh, and many of us might recall a time when we didn't have such uh, handy little devices, but they do so uh, with the availability of, uh, of things uh, such as GPS, uh, wireless communications, uh, they give us uh, directions. We take think nothing of making telephone calls and photographs. And sadly, underwater, none of those things really exist because uh, the ocean is uh, uh, very unfriendly to a lot of the the uh, sort of uh, things that enable. Uh, such wonderful th uh, devices as cell phones. Uh, electromagnetic radiation is, uh, of course, the, uh, anyone who's familiar with the, with the uh, work of Marconi would be, f uh, would be very familiar with. None of that travels any distance at all, only a few inches underwater. So that creates a huge challenge uh, for us in addition to some of the physical challenges of the deep ocean environment. And communications are really a, a, a major part of it. So we have to replace uh, sort of electromagnetic communications with acoustics and uh, increasingly complex uh, alternate means for communications, uh, such as uh, optical communications, so directed energy uh, or uh, short range, uh, high bandwidth communications using uh, photodiodes and, uh, and, uh, and associated electronics. And this sort of gives you an idea of, of where that th those communications uh, can be used, or at least uh, the throughput or ability for data to be transmitted over distances and you'll and you'll notice once you get out into tens or hundreds of kilometers uh, uh, your your bit rate becomes literally dots and dashes um, and that means that your robots have to be smart enough to be able to operate in a very sparse environment there's little 
or no ability to communicate uh, in at any uh, in any high bandwidth manner, um, and the robot needs to have enough intelligence so that these dots and dashes or sort of high level communications can still mean something, both in terms of returning information, but also uh, guiding the activities of the of the robot itself. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, the lack of GPS. So acoustics are used not only for uh, bouncing off the seafloor. Uh, many of you are familiar with fish finders, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, acoustic uh, uh, travel, uh, as that previous plot suggested, over large distances. And so by using time of flight, you can actually uh, uh, determine the, the robot's position. Uh, relative to either a research vessel, in this case the Atlantis is shown here, um, or by fixing transponders temporarily to the seafloor, um, sort of like cell phone towers, you can use them to range and provide uh, information about where the vehicle is. So um, these, these are challenges. Uh, I mentioned the use of sonar early on. These are some great examples of how sonar is used to map the seafloor, uh, as well as obviously communicate. Uh, and then imagery is becoming increasingly capable. Some of the early uh, images from the Argo system now are quite antiquated when you look at the idea of taking a sequence of these images and creating mosaics of much larger parts of the ocean or seafloor than you would otherwise be able to see. And uh, things like laser technology is becoming uh, likewise also a very valuable tool for providing all of these uh, maps. So uh, the brain of our robots, you know, human operated all the way to self-learning and, and, uh, and autonomy. So we have tethered vehicles. Uh, again, think of that stick and rudder analogy I mentioned uh, to the idea of making these systems more capable of, of, uh, of following scripts. Um, and, um, you know, uh, again, the idea that, uh, you know, show here uh, sort of Romba, an automated uh, vacuum cleaner for your house that can avoid objects. So not only does it give an instruction to clean the floor, but it can do so uh, while being aware of its environment. Uh, Sentry, uh, again, a vehicle at Woods Hole is being given uh, increasingly complex capabilities to uh, not only map the environment, but react to the environment. And uh, of course, we're familiar with things such as uh, self-driving cars, and you can see sort of where where this is, is going, even with some of the restrictions and limitations that I mentioned uh, earlier. So, you know, the idea of having a robot instead of being controlled by an individual uh, that has enough onboard intelligence to be able to sense uh, the environment, to use that sensed information to plan its activities and to act on those, uh, on the information and changing uh, nature of the environment in an increasingly complex way is really, again, a hallmark of what we're seeing in the future. To just shift gears a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll uh, talk briefly about some applications of the technology that Woods Hole's been involved with. Uh, this is some work we did uh, um, uh, a number of years ago uh, on behalf of the British government to, to do a, what at the time turned out to be a landmark survey of, the, of a, a bulk carrier that was lost in a typhoon in the Western Pacific. This is a sonar image of the debris sitting at about 5,000 meters. You can certainly see the uh, incredible destruction of the of a ship that size lying on the seafloor, and of course, the investigators were very interested in trying to understand uh, how that occurred. Uh, and we executed an exhaustive survey where we took, uh, uh, I think it was 140,000 images of the of the wreckage. Uh, each di digital image could be linked to the next one and we could provide the investigators with very clear ideas of, of what the uh, debris looked like, but using the uh, uh, imaging capabilities uh, at the time of the Argo vehicle and uh, the generation of digital uh, uh, photographs, it's possible to take 
those mosaic them together and to create a view of, in this case, the bow of the Derbyshire, which actually led the investigators to uh, concluding uh, the cause of loss, um, which had to do with flooding and loss of freeboard and uh, damage to the hatches and very rapid sinking and loss of all hands on board. Um, certainly for us, it was something that uh, not only did we help to determine the reason for how the Derbyshire was lost, but it, it actually resulted in a change to the classing of how bulk carriers were designed and provided us with a nice uh, letter from then President uh, Bill Clinton, uh, or to Bill Clinton, excuse me, from uh, from uh, from the Prime Minister uh, thanking, uh, thanking us for the work that we did on that. Uh, fast forwarding many years to uh, another uh, calamity was the uh, work that we did uh, at Woods Hole to respond to the loss of the Deepwater Horizon drill rig and the subsequent uh, uncontrolled loss of, uh, of oil into the environment. Um, uh, Woods Hole played uh, major roles. A um, uh, colleague and I, um, Rich Camilli, uh, went down to the to the uh, uh, to the disaster in the early days and used techniques to help map ma uh, map the uh, wellhead and learn about how much oil was being expelled, which actually turned out to be uh, quite valuable uh, for the government when it came time to uh, penalize BP for the disaster. BP, of course, would uh, would have rather uh, had a smaller amount of oil released and uh, uh, the U.S. government was in a position partly because of the work that was done uh, by Woods Hole to uh, uh, give them a much more accurate and uh, larger number uh, of how many gallons of oil were lost. And sometimes I use this as an, as an example of how investments in uh, science and technology can have tremendous benefits, not only in terms of understanding the impacts of a disaster like Deepwater Horizon, but also in the case of uh, the penalties involved, uh, uh, making sure those who were responsible uh, uh, paid, the, paid the price, so to speak. Um, lots of uh, airliners, the Air France 447, uh, which uh, was lost again with, uh, with everybody on board, uh, turned out to be a tremendous uh, uh, mystery. Um, the, uh, the Remus uh, vehicle, which is a uh, very uh, unique and capable underwater robot, autonomous underwater robot developed uh, again at Woods Hole, was used to uh, find the, the airliner. Uh, and uh, here's a shot of the uh, sonar imagery of the airliner on the seafloor. Again, similar to, to uh, what I showed with the Derbyshire, uh, the vehicle is able to, you know, gather much higher resolution imagery than would be uh, sonar imagery in this case of the of the uh, debris on the sitting on the seafloor, and then uh, through the use of digital photography, uh, is able to actually photograph. The debris on the seafloor and of course this uh, was extremely helpful in leading the investigators uh, directly to the uh, flight data recorder which was key to determining loss of the vessel. I think uh, a number of months ago a colleague of mine Morgan Terrell who is the acting director of the marine uh, branch of the National Transportation uh, 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 Safety Board um, brought us in to help um, learn about the loss of the uh, uh, El Faro. Um, you know, the, uh, the idea of trying to find the voyage data recorder uh, to try and um, provide uh, information that would help, um, again, investigators understand the circumstances of the tragic loss of all hands uh, was the key objective. And it was a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, if you take a look at the size of the ship and the small uh, recorder, the actual uh, uh, numbers kind of work out that it is a needle in a haystack. Um, the Navy was successful in actually initially locating the wreckage, but unfortunately the voyage data recorders circled here was missing. And, uh, and that's where uh, we were asked to uh, try and provide some of our capabilities and Sentry was really a key tool uh, in providing once again, the sort of large area map 
uh, you can see uh, each one of the tracks on the left is uh, is a uh, is a track of the Sentry vehicle. On the right uh, is a sonar image of the um, El Faro sitting on the seafloor. Um, and uh, um, shortly after we generated that material, we were able to uh, sort of use our knowledge of the of the wreckage, and the um, and the NTSB folks were. Uh, extremely adept at uh, guiding, based on that information, guiding the, the search to find the voyage data recorder, which was subsequently recovered, analyzed, and really provided, I think, a tremendous amount of information about the uh, deep ocean environment. Um, so sh shifting gears once again, sort of looking forward before uh, I, I finish up here, uh, you know, the, the ocean of things is, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, we spent a lot of time talking about the sort of lower left-hand side. So the submarines and robots and ships are very traditional tools, as you might think, uh, for expl exploring the ocean. But increasingly, we're adding more and more capability. And uh, we talked about gliders, uh, different uh, types of autonomous systems, uh, buoys, moorings, um, pairing these with autonomous surface craft. Uh, which are ships without a crew on board um, uh, with the um, addition of, uh, of satellite communications starts to build a, a much more holistic view of the ocean. And, uh, and I think that's critical, not uh, only for understanding the natural environment, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, with, uh, with increasing value in terms of managing uh, the type of work that uh, 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 is necessary, I think, for us to use the ocean. I include this just because I think it's a kind of uh, uh, tells you again a little bit of where the future is. These are uh, a crop or gaggle or a, a flock. I'm not sure what you'd call them. Uh, a, a swarm of uh, of robots. Um, and so these are becoming increasingly available um, for people to use for a range of purposes, um, you know, as opposed to a large uh, singular expedition, uh, you can deploy these from small vessels. Um, they can range, in this case, even into a coastal environment. And while, of course, they're very limited in their range and capability, uh, the, each one of them uh, can contribute really valuable measurements and insights that provide uh, us with the ability to make uh, much larger scale measurements over larger areas and over much longer periods of time. Um, you know, I think I just sort of wind up with the with the idea of humans and machines again, and the idea of telepresence. Uh, you know, uh, that early graphic that I showed at the beginning of the presentation from way back in the 1980s is is still operative uh, in the idea that uh, these robots, as, I, uh, as one of the earlier graphics suggested, can operate not only with uh, people on board vessels, but those vessels can communicate um, to shore base stations and uh, to much larger groups of individuals, uh, both involving a larger number of people in the process of exploring and discovering the ocean, but also increasingly by allowing operators ashore uh, to provide the support necessary for this, uh, this sort of ecosystem of capability. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of uh, just close it out with uh, the high latitudes. This might be uh, a subject for another uh, um, presentation, but I had the pleasure of visiting uh, the high latitudes uh, a little over a year ago on a Norwegian icebreaker, uh, the Kron Prince Hakon. And we took the sort of descendant of that Nereus vehicle, which I showed you sadly in a million pieces, uh, that idea and concept has been sort of recrafted uh, to provide us with the ability to work under polar ice. Um, and uh, tethered vehicles, of course, as you might imagine, are, could be uh, serious problems. Uh, trying to work under ice cover and the idea that these tether cables and again the increasing complexity of the robots provides uh, us with the ability to work 
uh, at high latitudes under extreme circumstances. And uh, I think just the, the sort of final thought would be, uh, you know, linking uh, the ocean. This is an animation which our, our colleague uh, James Cameron put together a number of years ago. So uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. Uh, these can be visited by submersibles and have revealed many secrets about the, uh, the nature of life on, on this planet. Um, but as the graphic sort of will attempt to sort of suggest, it not only uh, is, uh, 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 provides valuable insights about life on this planet, uh, but it's quite likely that there are oceans uh, on other planets, both within our solar system and outside. And um, it's not perhaps too much of a leap to think that those oceans might uh, harbor life uh, in, uh, in, in its own unique form, but uh, completely uh, separate from our own. So I think uh, with that, I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen. Um, and uh, if there are questions, uh, I'd be happy to, to do my best to answer them. OK. Thank you, Andy. That was a, um, a great um, presentation and very interesting. And I have to apologize. We've just had a little bit of a technical difficulty. But hopefully, you can see me and you can hear me. I can. Uh, very good. So now it's time for some questions. Um, but first, let me ask Andy if um, our audience is interested in learning more about what you have been talking about. Are there some resources, websites, books that you would recommend? Ab absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, the you know Woods Hole, ha the oceanographic uh, www.hui.edu is a is a fantastic place to uh, to visit if you're interested. There are, is a wealth of information not only about the material I've spoken about, but a, a huge number of resources for people that are interested in learning more. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, to uh, uh, visit the uh, HUI website um, and uh, you know when time and opportunity uh, 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 pr presents itself to come and visit the oceanographic. Great thank you and you mentioned that um, there's various organizations that you work with that do research. Would you be able to expand a little bit on the type of research that's done? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it covers the gambit. Uh, you know, uh, all all the basic fundamental dif disciplines are represented in in ocean sciences: uh, biology, uh, geology, physics, chemistry. Um, and, uh, and all of those uh, disciplines are being uh, practiced uh, uh, actively, not only at Woods Hole, but at many other uh, research organizations in the United States and uh, in fact, globally. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder that you can ask questions by typing in, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we do have a question from uh, W. Douglas, who says in the 1968 to 1970 period, he was with RCA and based at the Atlantic Undersea Test and Evaluation Center. Mm -hmm. um, back then, undersea ROVs were tested there. Do you still use those ranges to test your devices today? Yes, AUTAC uh, would be uh, would be the an acronym for for that. And uh, yes, it's uh, it's actually uh, been an area where uh, I've worked uh, in the early days. It's a unique uh, part of the ocean called Tongue of the Ocean. It's extremely deep, but very well protected um, and provides uh, a, a, an unusual. Uh, environment for the development and uh, testing of the types of technologies that I've been uh, uh, speaking about uh, this evening. Um, it, uh, it, it was an eye-opening uh, opportunity to go down there and learn about the incredible uh, 
uh, capabilities that this range had, uh, much of which was directed at uh, essentially kind of uh, helping develop, uh, you know, um, techniques for um, and tactics for submarines, uh, as well as testing uh, uh, things like torpedoes and uh, and uh, um, evasion and so forth. It was really a, an, an amazing place. And sonar, of course, uh, as as our uh, viewer would know, is a was a key part of all of this and cabling and uh, bringing all of that information to the surface and maintaining all of that was a really a Herculean task, I'm sure. Um, so uh, yes, Autech is, a, is a, a fabulous resource and still to this day. That's great. Thank, thank you so much for the answer. Um, we have a comment from Jack a question about whether Woods Hole is partnering with the efforts to use robotic technology to clear the ocean of plastics. That's occasionally in the news in the San Diego area. Yes, uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, contamination of the ocean by plastics, I think is uh, uh, widely known. Uh, you know, it's a great example of, uh, uh, you know, how uh, our simple acts can uh, impact the ocean. Uh, you can find examples of this type of contamination even in the poles. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, one of the things we saw when we visited the deepest part of the ocean was in fact garbage, um, plastic garbage, which is incredibly persistent. Um, yeah, Woods Hole is, uh, has got several efforts underway uh, to understand the sort of science behind uh, plastics in the ocean. Um, and, uh, you know, all the way from coming up with the tools uh, so that everyone can, in effect, speak the same language about plastics contamination, uh, which is, you know, sounds a, a, li a little bit trivial, but those tools are really, really important in terms of broadening the, the uh, playing field, if you will, for uh, people to be able to both learn about plastics, monitor their movements, uh, learn about where they're being, uh, uh, where, where they're being emanated from or, or their sources, and then you know, being uh, as wise as possible about how to uh, uh, prevent the contamination from, from occurring in the first place, which is by far the best strategy, of course. Uh, cleaning up after the fact is very expensive. And given the pervasive nature in, uh, of plastics in the ocean, perhaps not entirely practical. Um, uh, so the key is, uh, is, is really prevention, uh, uh, perhaps even learning how to modify the uh, nature of the plastics that, uh, that we use in everyday life uh, so that they're uh, not as pervasive or um, have shorter lifetimes or can be metabolized even by, uh, um, uh, you know, biological uh, 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 factors or activity that takes place in the ocean. Um, so yes, there are several um, uh, important initiatives at the institution that are looking at, at, at plastics, but uh, just as uh, um, aspects of understanding the car carbon cycle, uh, you mentioned at the beginning the ocean twilight zone. Uh, there is a, a great deal to do. The ocean is, of course, a global phenomena. It's critical to our well-being. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, the challenges are tremendous um, and uh, certainly an invigorating part of what uh, forms every, everyone's uh, sort of burning need, if you will, to go out and, uh, and uh, do extraordinary things. Thank you, Andy. Um, we have a que question from a viewer named Liz, and she asks whether are there any underwater exploration off of Cape Cod? Sure. Um, there are, uh, there's, there's a range of activities to a certain degree because of its proximity to Woods Hole. Of course, our researchers do a great deal of work there. Uh, there is an ocean observing network that is not uh, too far from Cape Cod. 
in the deep water. Uh, this is a series of buoys and instruments, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 a variety of, uh, of sensors that are able to provide us with uh, sort of a, uh, almost a version of uh, weather stations, if you will, uh, offshore. Uh, the Hudson Canyon uh, may be familiar to, 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 uh, to some of the listeners. Uh, that's an area that has a great deal of interest from the biological perspective. The canyons are uh, connect the the uh, uh, coastal waters to the to the deep abyssal waters. Uh, they have a tremendous role to play in terms of productivity of the of the uh, of the ocean ecosystem. Um, and uh, the seamounts that exist to the north. Uh, the uh, Stellwagen Bank, for example, uh, is, uh, is, is also an area that is uh, visited quite frequently. So it runs the, the gambit. Again, uh, you know, biology, there's uh, geology, uh, understanding the way the ocean moves, the currents and so forth, uh, uh, the, the, the role that the, uh, uh, the coastal environment plays in keeping us, uh, keeping us fed, um, is is really a, a key uh, one of many key activities that the institution has underway. Thank you. And sort of maybe along the same lines, there are you continually mapping particular areas of the ocean? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and uh, and and uh, there are uh, efforts to do successive surveys. So uh, there, there are long-term sites that are visited uh, uh, periodically. Um, the traditional way is, uh, you know, once a year or twice a year, there will be a ship that goes out and takes a range of measurements. Um, and, uh, and that is uh, active to this day and has been something that's been going on for decades. But some of the technology I talked about earlier also is enabling those measurements to be made from shore. Um, so uh, deploying a robot from a shore-based station and having it swim out or, and stay uh, in the coastal environment and make uh, in, uh, observations over longer periods of time is really the, 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 uh, you know, one of the key aspects that uh, I think is, is, uh, is, is sort of emerging for the future. Um, to provide us with that, with with ever more sort of gr uh, granular understanding about about the environment. Okay. Thank you, Janet and Gary would like to know whether they can see a, any of these tools if they visit Hawaii. They absolutely can, and the the exhibit center, uh, which I believe. Uh, 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 unfortunately at the moment is, uh, I don't think uh, accessible to the public, uh, but um, you know, um, we would expect uh, in the coming months that there'll be some limited ability to reopen uh, that. And uh, like many museums uh, 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 to provide people with an opportunity to come and see uh, some of the science and the technology and hardware. There's an example of an autonomous underwater vehicle um, uh, in the case of uh, the one that's on exhibit, it was actually used to track sharks off uh, Chatham. And in fact, uh, I think shows the, shows the scars of having been attacked but, uh, by a white shark. So you can see those uh, uh, cables, cameras, uh, and then of course, uh, learn about the science that, uh, the, that those kinds of tools enable. So by all means, there is a exhibit center. Again, if you visit the institution, um, uh, uh, the website, you should be able to uh, learn more um, about uh, that exhibit center and stay in touch with when, it, uh, when it's reopened and available for, uh, for everyone to visit. Great. Something to look forward to. <laughs> and question from Gian, Giovanni, excuse me. Besides sonar, what other systems of communication exist with the robots? So are they pre-planned and they go off on their own? Are you able to control them or change them once they're in their course? So yeah, communications, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation is really one of the big challenges. And I, I'm sort of fond of, of, 
of maybe uh, thinking about history and uh, naval history in particular, you know, autonomy has always been a key attribute. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, Admiral uh, Nelson, I'm sure, was given essentially a letter that uh, said, go and make our shipping lanes safe. There was no centralized control. And that's partly because of the difficulty of communications at long distances and th that the ocean creates. For our robots, uh, as I mentioned, uh, acoustics uh, are uh, valuable tools. There are advances that are taking place to pack more information into those acoustic signals, but they are inherently limited. Um, for higher bandwidth type communications, you either need a physical cable or, or a fiber, for instance, through which you can pass information through the, through, uh, from the robot to the, to the operators, um, or uh, over short distances, lasers can be used, um, or you have to come to the surface and uh, use a satellite. Um, so those are really the tools that we have, and there are small incremental improvements being made all the time in the ability of those tools to transmit information, but I don't think we're going to see uh, major breakthroughs given the sort of physics of uh, seawater or uh, water in general as it relates to a lot of the communications that we're used to uh, taking advantage of in a in, an, in a terrestrial um, environment above the water's surface. Okay. Thank you, Andy. So our last question of the night is who are we involved with any of the wind farms being planned in the sound or nearby waters? Yes, uh, there uh, is, uh, I think, a recently funded uh, project by the Department of Energy, uh, which is intended to help uh, monitor the marine environment uh, in an area that might be uh, you utilized for wind farms going forward um, and, to, and to understand and manage the impacts uh, in a thoughtful way. Um, so uh, that will uh, rely on many of the tools that I've sort of described this evening. So autonomous surface craft, and sending, instead of sending a ship out there with a crew on board, there'll be uh, uh, robotic uh, ships that uh, will be working in those kinds of environments, as well as some of these undersea robots that are uh, mapping the seafloor uh, uh, taking samples, uh, monitoring the health of the, of the marine environment. Those will be uh, key parts, I think, of what will make a successful enterprise of extracting uh, energy from wind over the horizon at a, in, a, uh, uh, in a wind farm. Thank you. It's amazing all of the different areas that you touch and all the work that you've done with in a tragic situation, as well as sort of preserving, all, you know, the oceans for, for the future. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate your, your time tonight, Andy. So well, a as pleasure. a small token of our appreciation, we're going to be sending you this Chatham Marco Pony Maritime hat. So we'll Terrific. get that off to you. We also want to invite you to come by the museum. We're, we're no longer exit 11 off of six, but um, I'm sure you can find us. Yes. Well, definitely. Uh, I, th I think, as I mentioned to you, one of, one of my uh, favorite uh, wintertime expeditions is to come uh, down Cape and, uh, and explore. Uh, and the Marconi uh, site is a fantastic uh, and really pleasant place to visit. So thank you for the invitation. I definitely have, would, will enjoy coming and visiting the, the museum. Fabulous. And I thank you again for your time. And I'd like to also thank our audience for participating for the many questions that you've asked. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next month. Good night.